all of you, one nation under God, indivisible. I remember that uh, things started out that way, and uh, it will continue. And uh, you and I, sometimes we, we are filled with despair and criticism or things like that over things, but you do live in a pretty incredible country. I don't know if you understand that. I guess you don't, so, okay. That's the end of that message. Happy birthday, United States of America. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed your weekend. Don't you love when 4th of July lands on like a Thursday? Or like a Wednesday, you can just take both weekends off. That's all I did. I mean, I haven't been around, I've been doing nothing. Gave the whole staff you know, time off. It's been a good deal. Thank you, Brian Calloway. Did you like that? Would that go into the, that go into the, uh, thank you, Brian Calais, for preaching for me last Sunday. We were away uh, last Sunday very early in the morning. Uh, if any of you, all of you that have had the pure joy of taking a flight out of MCI early in the morning. Now, I love the new airport. Some of you, me, a little cranky about it. But it's like a real, we have a real airport now. It's not embarrassing. You go to other places. I mean, we flew into Rochester, New York. I think that airport's still in circa 1940 or something like that. And, but I'm very thankful for airplanes because some grandchildren and uh, great-grandchildren were able to get on and get up there on Sunday. We had a wonderful time with great-grandpa and Nina and... Uh, Little grandson Gabe at four years old uh, with that blonde hair and blue eyes figured out how to win over Mina. So now he has a great grandma that'll give anything to him that he wants. <laughs> Never mind everything else. And of course, we get mother a little bit upset at that. But we had a wonderful time. So thank you for, for uh, to all of you that took the time to pray for us. And my father-in-law is doing well in good health. Um, but of course, he's 83 years old, and uh, conversations are good over the Lord and things, but conversion in the Lord is still something that he keeps at arm's length. And so continue to pray, and also for his wife, uh, Milt and Sheila, are, are precious to us. And to be able to have a time, any of you that have done it, and take grandchildren on a trip for a few days, it's worth it. And uh, it was really good. They did great, and and so very thankful for airplanes. I don't know about the drive. I don't know about that 20 hours in the, in the car. I don't know. You know, I don't know. But thank you, God. Go to Luke 14. Let's jump into the Word of God a little bit. I'm going to reference 13 a little bit here for a few moments and kind of catch you up. We were in Luke 13 two Sundays ago. Now we're here at the first Sunday of July, and before you know it, this month will walk away from us. But it is Independence Day weekend, and happy birthday, as I said earlier, to our country. I mention uh, every once in a while, and just a little bit of math stuff, that in two years, and of course, it'll be 2026. And since the birth of our country was 1776, do a little bit of math, 250 years. That There'll be a big celebration, I'm sure, in some form and fashion. And uh, so here we are in 2024. Never thought that we'd make it this far, but we're making it this far. We may have to keep on going, so praise the Lord. We look to the Word of God. We look to the life of Jesus Christ in our study in Luke and say, how do you do this, Jesus? And, and so he's going to teach us some more things out of Luke chapter number 14. Uh, I'm so thankful for the Gospels, as I mention every once in a while, that you know, that's the good news. It is the, the gospel. It is um, this man named Luke who, of course, in his conversion was later on in life as Paul was making some journeys, uh, his missions journeys. And, of course, this man came to know Christ and then toured around a little bit with, with old Paul the apostle. I can imagine as a doctor and as a Gentile doctor, of course, his side of things is to speak about matters of Jesus Christ with a lean toward Son of Man, Son of God. We see, of course, Jesus Christ speaking uh, about the kingdom of God. He used parables a great deal. 
in this gospel, and of course, they're mentioned in the synoptic side of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but there's a lot of neat things that are unique to Luke's gospel, and we've covered a great deal of them. Um, so again, thank you, Brian, for jumping in last week, and now we're back to our study, and of course, I've heard wonderful things about Prime to Summer Camp. I'm thankful that um, Josh let me know that he knows for sure that a that four young students came to know Jesus as Savior, and there's other things to be able to be proclaimed and spoken about, and, and I'll leave it to them. We're going to have a Wednesday night celebration at the end of the month for primed summer camp, and look forward to hearing all that God has done and what God uh, will then continue to do in the lives of the young people, and, and it was a neat, neat time again from what I understand, for even the servant team. And uh, they uh, kind of missed some of the rain. They had some sprinkles and some things like that. I heard that Blue Springs got a couple of, couple of feet of, of rain again while we were away. But uh, in Life Change Camp, they were able to kind of avoid the rain a bit and have a, a really, really good camp. So I'm thankful for that. In our text, let me, let me just kind of give you a quick Luke 13 with your finger in Luke 14 reminder in chapter number 13 verse 5 um, as the people have come back over to Jesus and asked him questions about all these poor people that have suffered and what Pilate has done to them he says in verse 5 I tell you nay but except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish a reminder that Jesus Christ took the generalization of the plight and heartache of many that people were concerned about and he brought it to someone in the audience very personal hey how about you do you repent of your way your sin and understand that i am the way the truth and the life you go a little bit further verse 10 down through uh, 17 we have jesus christ and we'll reference something like this in another uh, another context in chapter 14 but in 13 it shows us that jesus christ he's in the synagogue on the sabbath we believe it's in judea and uh, he's making his way from Galilee to Judea to Perea to then, of course, he's making his way eventually to Jerusalem and his last journey of earthly ministry. And it says there that he healed a woman that a spirit of infirmity, she was bowed together, which means she was crippled up and she was bowed down in a crippling manner for 18 years. And it shows that she was loose from her infirmity. And he healed her. Of course, he got a lot of criticism from those in the synagogue. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. You go a little bit further, of course, in uh, chapter number 13, verse 23, an incredible question. And we spoke on this last time we got together in Luke's study about salvation, the, the most important topic of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. It says there in the question, these people, these Jewish people, as he's journeying toward Jerusalem, ask him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And then, of course, he went into, he said unto them, strive to enter the straight gate. For many, I say, unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able the issue of salvation, that few will be saved, that few will enter into the straight gate. See, Jesus Christ, he himself, the God of the universe, King of kings, Lord of lords, master teacher, Rabboni, he knew that many, 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 many would reject him just in his time of earthly ministry, not to mention to reject the Lord God Almighty for the thousands of years before that, the nation of Israel. And then since then, the centuries of the rejection of Jesus Christ, as we know in our theme verse, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to save the lost. And now we go to Luke 14. And we see in Luke 14, just, just to consider what's going to happen right here, he has been invited to a meal. He's been invited to dinner, the Sabbath meal. The Sabbath is the last day of the week. It is a time of rest. It points to the creation of God and the Sabbath day. Who is the Lord of the Sabbath? 
the Lord Jesus Christ. It proclaims it himself in Luke chapter number 6 when they confound and they fight with him over the matter of him showing mercy to heal. Well, today in our study, in our look here, we're just going to look at 14 verses in Luke chapter number 14, and we see that Jesus Christ has been given an invitation of the chief of Pharisees, maybe a Sanhedrin council member, a leader of the Pharisees, but there's also lawyers in the setting. There's also other Pharisees. If you were to have a meal, if you were to have a wedding feast, if you have an anniversary or a birthday dinner for somebody. By the way, my birthday's coming up, so I mean, I don't, no, no, please no. But if you were to have an anniversary, a get-together, a wedding feast, you would go down the roll of the people that you know and you would invite them. And then you would have some of them sit here, some of them sit here. You know why those wedding planner people and then those reception hall people make so much money? Because they got to figure out what kind of placards to put on the table so there's no fights. If the wrong people sit at the wrong table and it's a family get-together, there's going to be a fight. When I got married to Cheryl, a nice Gentile boy marrying a half-Gentile, half-Jew, what do we call her? A Samaritan. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you remember the room. The room had Hatfields, McCoy, no, no. It had Italians, it had Jews, and it had the Hicks from New England. And if you sat them at the wrong table, oh boy. But this is an important setting because when you bring people over to your home for the Sabbath meal, this chief of Pharisees, the Pharisees had a way of kind of muckying it up a little bit. Let me show you how much we have from God because we're blessed by more than others. So the Sabbath meal might be this big spread and you're wondering, what happened to God in this setting? Why do I set it up like that? Because you've had people over to your home, and you might have people over to your home. But what if you were to have Jesus Christ to come visit? Thus our title today, Look Who's Coming to Dinner Today. Look who's coming to dinner. What would it be like if the Lord Jesus Christ came to your religious gathering? Today at noon, we are having a special lunch in the fellowship hall and Jesus Christ is going to be there. How many of us would run from that setting? How many of us would say, whoa, look who's coming to dinner. I hope that nobody invited the Lord God Almighty. What would that be like? Well, we know the chief of Pharisees, he wasn't asking Jesus to come to his house for the Sabbath meal because he wanted to learn something from the God of the universe. You know why he had him there. He was plotting, he was planning, he wanted to set him up for a trap, and the trap ends up getting him. Think in the context here today as we read the scripture and we read the verses about this setting for a meal for the Sabbath at this chief of Pharisees' house. Then Jesus teaches to them a parable. He's going to do parable teaching to the Pharisees for a little bit in chapter number 14. And then we're going to see in verses 12, 13, 14, which I, some put it all together and go, you know, verse 7 all the way through 14. I see something 12 through 14 that is, to me, a broken, broken off part of it. In fact, in your King James Bible, if you have one of those that shows those little paragraph markings, you see one there in verse 7, paragraph Verse 12, paragraph, verse 15. So there's a breaking point of the scripture writing and how this is laid out. So I see that even in those last few verses, there's a lesson to be learned. Let's read this scripture, chapter number 14, verse number 1. Follow along with me. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. Interesting, they're watching him. We've seen this phraseology before. They're watching him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Simply put in Scripture in those times, dropsy meant someone whose 
vital organs are being compromised by liquid or water. They, they're holding and retaining liquid, and it's compromising the organs. It would be like COPD today or congestive heart failure. This is where this person's at, and they have been brought, this person, this certain man is brought before him. It's very interesting in the text what is going on here. Verse 3, and Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, it is, lawf- is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Good question, Jesus. And they held their peace. Interesting, they didn't answer him. They're trying to set him up. Do you have compassion and mercy to heal on the Sabbath? Or on the other side of it, if you don't, then that means you're holding to the Sabbath. But if you then heal this person on the Sabbath, you're breaking Moses' law. We've been through this before, haven't we? Okay. They held their peace. He took him, he healed him, and let him go. It's a beautiful statement. Jesus Christ, they hold their peace after asking him. He asked him a question. He took him, healed him, let him go. Now Jesus speaks in a very stern way and answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass, ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Boy, oh boy, Jesus has a way of silencing the room. Verse 7 now, down through 11. Let's catch this section of the parable. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. The word bidden means simply to be invited, to be called, to be asked. When he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and to say to thee, give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Wouldn't it be terrible if you sat in the wrong spot and you were supposed to sit somewhere and says, hey, get out of that spot. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Jesus is teaching a profound truth here. We continue in verse number 10. But when thou art bidden, Go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Verse 12 through 14. Last section of Scripture that we'll cover today in our lesson. Verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. What what an incredible few verses here. A lot to walk through. When you and I think about, look who's coming to dinner, we think, oh, Jesus is really in a place of having another time of healing someone like he did back in Luke 13, and, and it's on the Sabbath, and, and it's, again, a testing of him, and he's being washed, and we're thinking, Jesus, why did you go to this invitation and meal when you know you're going to be set up? Well, we know about Jesus a little bit. His incredible heart for all people groups. In fact, Jesus continually had a burden for the lost sheep of Israel. Luke 13 stated he lamented over Israel. It says in the last couple verses of Luke 13, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee? For how often would I have gathered thy children together? Remember this a couple weeks ago? As a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. He wanted to take care of them. Come, 
Come and I will care for you, and I will show you the way, the truth, and the life. That's who I am. He says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Ooh, Jerusalem, desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus' heart laments over Jerusalem. Salvation is his big topic. Salvation is what he desires for a people Israel. Remember what is said in verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? <laughs> yeah, there's few that be saved. Think of what happened down in chapter 13, verse 28, 29. As Jesus is speaking of Old Testament Isaiah stuff, the weeping, gnashing of teeth, when Abraham, Isaac, all the prophets of the kingdom, you're, you yourselves will be thrust out. Verse 29, here's now how Jesus says, you Jews, you don't believe in me as the Messiah. You don't believe in me. You'll be excluded. But what about the Gentiles? The Gentiles, it shows in verse 29, and they shall come from the east to west, north, south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. You're going to lament one day as I lament over you. Jesus continually had a burden. In fact, his burden for all was manifested by a ministry style to move toward, to move, to move toward the multitudes, the Pharisees, the publicans, the Gentile, the Jew. Was there ever any, any group that Jesus avoided when it came to speaking his message of salvation? Never. There was never a group, never a people group that he said, no, in fact, greater proof can we not have than for him to go into a Pharisee's house, a chief of Pharisees. Later we see where he goes into Zacchaeus' house. What does Zacchaeus do for a living? He's regarded as a publican who grabs an awful lot of cash. And Zacchaeus turns his life to Jesus Christ and repents. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That verse comes out of Luke chapter number 19. This is proof for us truly that Jesus had a heart for all peoples. And for you and me, we look at that invitation of Jesus Christ to all people groups and we're here 2,000 years later saying, thank you, Jesus, that the gospel wasn't just for the Jew, but it was for the Greek, the barbarian, all Gentiles, and Jesus Christ, again, showed his burden through his ministry style to move toward people. Look, everyone, if you really think that people are going to come knocking on your door and ask you to show them how to get saved, I know you don't think that. I, I, I know, but we act like that. We do. We think if we just do enough, then maybe they'll come and ask us. And that happens a lot. I, I know that. Someone might say, boy, your testimony is really something that I desire. The way you live, the way you walk, the way you talk, I love that about you. Is it about something you have that I just, I've never seen before? Yes, you'll have that happen. But rarely will it be that you'll be sitting around and people will come up to you and say, oh, please tell me how to go to heaven. Please tell me how to be saved. Please tell me about Jesus. For how many of you has that happened in the last five years of you sitting and having someone come up to you? It's always been you moving towards someone. You moving. You inviting. You pushing the gospel into someone's life. In fact, let's just look at this quote about Jesus Christ and his burden. Wearsby says it well. In fact... Instead of hosts or guests judging Jesus, it was Jesus who passed judgment on them when they least expected it. There in this setting, they think they've got Jesus, but Jesus is showing them and revealing to them their wicked hearts. Indeed, in this respect, he was a dangerous person to sit with at a meal or to follow on the road. In Luke 14, we see Jesus dealing with five different kinds of people and exposing what was false in their lives and their thinking. We ask again, would we allow Jesus into our home and ask him to a meal on a Saturday evening? 
Let's never underestimate or understate the focus of Jesus Christ's interactions. What is at the heart of the matter, you know the phrase, is the matter of the heart. Would you invite Jesus Christ to come to dinner? If so, what would be your reasons? Because Jesus Christ is about to teach in our setting today, and we'll break it down. We've got just three simple lesson points here in our overall look at, look who's coming to dinner. And you think, okay, what's Jesus Christ doing? Well, I could have put up there, guess who's coming, but I thought, look who's coming to Jesus because, uh, coming to dinner, because it's Jesus Christ and we know this dinner is a setup on the part of the Pharisees, and yet Jesus Christ is the one who's the, the controller of the atmosphere and the environment in the room. He's teaching the Pharisees directly about what it means to believe, to follow, to learn. In fact, this text gets even heavier as we break down the rest of chapter number 14, and he speaks directly about this great supper and how you Pharisees were invited to a meal. You got a personal invitation from me and you end up coming up with a lot of excuses. Many of you know the text. And it even gets heavier when he talks to the great multitude about how, what it means to come to me and follow me. You can't love anyone else besides me or you cannot be my disciple. This is, again, heavy, serious stuff. Look who's coming to dinner. <laughs> it's Jesus Christ. His enemies wanted to watch him. His enemies wanted to criticize him, condemn him, correct him. They wanted to contend with him. And he says, hey, it's not going to happen that way. I'm reminded again of how Jesus Christ did so much teaching. He used parable teaching. I put a slide up there. You can uh, jot down or just look it up yourself. It's for a, a good study. But when he taught on the parables, I liked how Mark's gospel laid it out. Go to Mark chapter number 10 if you want. I know it's up on the screen if you just want to follow. Sometimes, uh, Mark chapter number 4. Don't get ahead of yourself, Brownie. We'll get to Mark 10 in a little bit. Mark chapter number 4. Consider the text here and understand that as Jesus has been teaching in parables and he does the, the sower and the seed and the soil, and they ask him, and there's an explanation in, in Matthew's gospel as well. We know that Jesus Christ said, hey, these are the parables in which I want you to learn. I want you to learn from me and my parable teaching. And we understand that parables basically are a story, an allegory that brings a heavenly truth with a physical or earthly illustration. You pick it up there in verse number 10. It says there, And when he was alone, they that were about with him, the twelve, asked of him the parable. Hey, wh what did you just teach Jesus? Uh, we want to know. In, ver in fact, verse number 9 says, And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Verse number 11 and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing, they may see and not perceive. Have you ever been around those kind of people? They see it. Oh, I see what you're talking about. But they don't really grasp it. Their perception level is, they're not grabbing the spiritual message of things. Some of you teach the Bible to other people and you're going, I think they see what I'm doing, but they're half asleep. Well, that's probably because the teaching isn't very good. Just kidding. Oftentimes it's the listener, but sometimes it is the teacher. I get that. He says, hey, disciples, followers, learners, hearing they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Verse 13, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all the parables? Hey, disciples, you are the learners. You're the ones that see, and you see it, but you perceive. You've got a connection to the Lord through the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is giving you a perception. Hearing, 
So many people hear things. Right now, you can hear my big mouth. It's amplified in the back. It's turned up. Why do I need to be turned up? I'm sure you're asking that. So you can hear me, right? But hearing, what if you don't understand what you just hear? We use the word listen now. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, it talks about attend to. That's what God's word is, to attend to a matter, a la John Sarah, who straightened me out almost 20 years ago. The Bible word is attend. Do you and I really attend to things? We see, but we don't perceive. But the disciple, the learner says, I see it, I hear it, I perceive it, I understand it. Remember, Jesus is teaching parables today. He's teaching with a parable today. He's teaching in an incredible setting like he does so often, and he teaches with a lot of parables. That's what we're looking at. What I've got, as I said earlier, three simple things I want you to grasp. I'm just gonna count them off, take just a few minutes on each one, and you're gonna see that from this side of, hey, look who's coming to dinner, I want you to consider what kind of host you would be. That's my strategy this morning. In fact, here's my first lesson point to support this. What kind of host would you be? What kind of host would we be? Would you and I be that type of host that has a surface holiness? People can see our holiness on the surface. Jesus might look at us and go, you just have holiness on the surface. This is the pious churchgoer, conflicted about who Jesus Christ really is. You cannot know Jesus Christ any more than a surface level unless you spend time in the Word of God. I know Jesus. Do you? Do you really know who he is? Do you know what he's about? Do you know why he did what he did? Do you have questions for Jesus? I do. Do you have questions in the word of God? Do you get into the word of God with somebody? Do you and your spouse sit down and study some things together? Do you study with your children? Do you look at things that matters? Do you read parables to your children? Do you read in the book of Acts with your kids? Do you, do you look at the church letters? Not to mention, I heard that in the Old Testament, there's 39 other books. Do you understand how Genesis pulled off an awful lot of things and things came to be the firsts of so many things? Do you understand the first five books of the Old Testament, the law of Moses? Do you understand the Psalms and the Proverbs, the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets? Do you understand that God is speaking because they're all pointing to Jesus Christ. Do you know who Jesus Christ really is? Because this is the pious churchgoer, the Pharisee, who says, hey, I know all about religion, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse number six. And they could not answer him again to these things. They were quieted by conviction. I mentioned it when I was reading through the text. In verse six it says, and they held their peace, which means when he asked the question in verse three, they didn't say anything. It could be two sides to look at. They're watching him to see what he is going to do. And if he shows mercy again on her, excuse me, on him to heal the dropsy, huh, look at what he's done. He's broken the Sabbath. But then if he holds to the Sabbath, he has no mercy. Jesus Christ is saying, look, by my statement, my presence, and what I've just said to you, I can truly see that the Sabbath has been mixed up by you. Truly it was set apart by God from creation and the creator God to make the Sabbath as a day of rest. But now I am here and I am the Lord of the Sabbath and understand that I've already violated a lot of your Sabbath rules. In fact, up at the screen, on the Sabbath, Jesus had already violated his Sabbath traditions on at least seven different occasions. He cast out the unclean devil, healed the fever, disciples plucked the corn, and they, the Pharisees, were watching what he was doing with his disciples walking through the field. He healed the impotent man. 
He healed the withered hand. He healed the bowed woman. In fact, back in Luke chapter number 13, we mentioned it earlier. Look at verse number 14. Luke 13, 14. One page back. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because the Jews, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, these are six days. There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. By the way, you can't heal them. Pharisees, keepers of the synagogue. And how does the Lord answer them? Verse 15, thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? In chapter number 14, what does he say? Do you not take your ass or your ox fall into the pit, and will you not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? He basically is saying the same thing I mentioned a couple weeks ago when I preached on this. Do you value the life of an animal more than you value the life of this woman or this man? Do you value holding to the letter of the law more than you would like to witness the glory of God through me, Jesus Christ? It's so clear what Jesus Christ is doing here. He's pointing out to them where their hearts are at. Back in Luke chapter number 6, if you want to turn there, I've got a couple of the verses out of Luke 6 there that really support and make this clear. Luke 6, verse number 1, a reminder, it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Verse 2, certain of the Pharisees said unto them, why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? So, of course, we preached on this a few months back in October. The, l- listen, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they're constantly picking on a way to trip up Jesus Christ. Will you look a little bit further into the text? You see in verse number 7, the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. Does that sound familiar? Over in Luke chapter number 14, it says, as they watched him, that they watched him. But he knew their thoughts. He said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. And Jesus said unto them, I ask you one thing. Sound familiar? Does Jesus repeat his teaching? Yes. Is Jesus trying to drive a point home? Yes. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? Would you withhold the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to give somebody an opportunity to call on the name of the Lord to be saved because you're following a ritual and a command to be self-righteous before God? I wonder if that's what the surface holiness is all about back in chapter number 14 when we see the chief Pharisees, we see the lawyer, we see the Pharisees. We understand that in this setting in Luke 14, they could not answer him again to these things. What did it say up on the screen? They're quieted because of conviction. What quiets me? What shuts my mouth is the conviction of God. At that point, it's better just to shut our mouths like these Pharisees here. I'd hate to be that kind of host, but I wonder what kind of host we would be. Would we have the surface holiness as pious churchgoers that are really conflicted about who Jesus Christ is. We need to get a chance deeper to know Jesus Christ and we won't be that pious believer. We'd be a better host of Jesus. My second one that I have up there, what kind of host would you be? Would you be a person? Would I be a person? What host would we be of having a secret hollowness? See, no one can see inside of us. Hollow would be something that's empty. What kind of host would we be? Maybe that's why I don't want Jesus to come to my house. I don't know. This is the inflated ego believer. Confused about positional importance. I have a position, you know. 
I'm a believer in the kingdom. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, you know, I am the chief Pharisee of the Sanhedrin. I, I have a position here. Jesus is saying, well, what good is that position? Because your humility would be a whole lot more received by God because when I'm humbled, he will exalt me. You know all the scriptures. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. In this setting, they're thinking, my position as a Pharisee, inviting certain other Pharisees and other people, Jesus tells an incredible, incredible, incredible story about how the people that are invited, what they do when they come into the room. You know, at the the wedding, as I mentioned and jokingly earlier, that everybody needs to sit in their place. Well, consider again Jesus' parable. You sit down in the highest room because position is important to you or to me. And we're confused by our positional importance, and that hides this secret hollowness of not really having my value in the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand value, significance. I understand that love that's lost by people because they have gone through awful times. But when you come to Jesus Christ and you're a, be- and you're a true believer, you don't have to have an ego that's inflated by your position in Jesus. Position with the fellowship and the other believers. You and I need to be humbled by exaltation that's by God. This parable about what should really determine our position is simply by how I act before other people, how we act before the Lord, how we treat other people. Do I need to sit in the highest place? Consider this setting. In the Jewish times, there is a low couch setting for the people to come into. But there are different rooms in the house where people can be seated. And there also is this big table with three on one side, three on another, and a three on another, and these long couches that are there. And that place of honor, that high place would be in the middle. It would be a spot where, hey, there's a middle spot on that side, a middle spot on that side, a middle spot on that side, a middle spot on this side. So there's four higher spots. And then there's other places in the building, in the room, in this home, where you could regale yourself because of this positional importance. But what if, what if we looked at ourselves and said, verse 10, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down. You've been asked, you've been invited. Don't even bother to look around and see if you're at the highest place. Go and find the lowest room. That when he that bade thee the one who invited you, says, hey, friend, why don't you come over here and sit at our table? I want you to come to a higher spot. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. People will say, wow, your friend has said that you can sit here. They've recognized you and lifted you and given you a place of worship. Because it says in verse number 11, for whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Familiar passage up on the screen, Luke chapter number 18. You can go there with me if you want. The text, of course, Jesus Christ is very close to Jerusalem. He's leading up to this place. He's really at the very, very last leg of his ministry before he hits Jerusalem in Luke chapter number 19. And we see him teaching a parable in the beginning. The parable to this end, that men ought always to pray, not to faint. He's teaching parable after parable continually here. Verse number 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised other. The positional importance in the group of believers. I have an inflated ego. We get confused over our importance. It says in this parable by Jesus, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, 
I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers even as this publican. The publican simply is a, a sinner, a gatherer of monies in Zacchaeus's particular case in chapter number 19. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, verse number 13, standing afar off, he, would, he, he stood aw, away off. He would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says in this parable, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. The word abase very simply means to point to humility, to have a changed rank, to have a step down in your rank and your position. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humbled by exaltation. That is an interesting statement because the exaltation is Jesus' exaltation, not you and me. Consider this as you read the text back in Luke chapter number 14 and you see what is being stated here. Jesus Christ very simply with both parables, Luke 14, Luke 18, and his continued teaching is saying, be humbled. Don't be a person of surface secret, empty, self-importance. Be a man or be a woman of God as a believer who says, God, I'm just thankful that I am saved. Thank you, Jesus. Last one. What kind of host would we be? Would we be quieted by conviction, humbled by exaltation, or blessed by resurrection. Sly haughtiness is on the other side of that. What about this haughtiness, this arrogance? This is the ministry leader. Look at these. These are ministry leaders here he's speaking to. They are the religious leaders. It's troubling. If your deacons, your elders, your pastors... As Jesus is speaking to them, would have this type of haughtiness and hollowness. They would have this surfacey holiness. This sly haughtiness simply means that this ministry leader has been compromised in their own thinking about spiritual influence. You know how many people I've discipled? You know this church would not be the same without me. I... I don't know how they even get by without me. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm pretty wonderful, don't you? You see, when we get to that place of haughtiness as a ministry leader, we, we think everybody follows us until you look around and you realize nobody's following you. It says very simply this in the text, in verse number 12, when Jesus turns and faces them back, the lawyers, the Pharisees, and the chief Pharisee, he said, hey, when you make dinner or supper and you bid people to come, stop asking the people that you're wanting to get something from. You know if you invite certain people, you're going to get good gifts. And then they'll reciprocate the invitation to meal by inviting you. Gosh, I hope that, that the O'Neills invite me to their house. Sean O'Neill's going to make some brisket, maybe some pulled pork. Gosh, the thing is, I'm going to make out on that. I'm not inviting him to my house ever because I don't have anything for him. Now, that's sarcasm. But let's go one step to what Jesus is saying. How is it that you constantly... Invite only the same people that can recompense you on this earth when Jesus says, hey, what about the lame, the blind, 
The lame can't give you anything. The blind can't add any extra because they don't have any wisdom. I mean, I just need to make sure that you realize that when you say poor, maimed, lame, blind, you're really saying true, Jesus? Yes, because your haughtiness as a ministry leader can get you to a place where you've compromised what spiritual influence you have because your spiritual influence is in you. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Word of God in you. It's the Holy Spirit welling up inside of you so that the fruit of the Spirit comes oozing out, and that's what people see. Blessed by resurrection, it says in verse number 14 very simply, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Just a sidebar, don't forget who the just one is. Sometimes in our arrogance when we read Scripture, we must be talking about me. The resurrection of the just. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection in life. The resurrection of the just. Mark chapter number 10 has a really cool accounting. Matthew has an accounting of the disciples coming to Jesus. I'll read this and be done in our text. This is how we'll finish today. Blessed by resurrection. In Matthew's accounting, we have in Matthew 20, even so as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Keep in mind similar speak in Mark. I like the way Mark's accounting comes at it. It says there in Mark chapter number 10, verse 43. In fact, pick it up in verse number 41. And when the 10 heard it, they were really angry at James and John. Like, they're all innocent. Because they have been told by Jesus Christ that all 12 of them will be sitting in thrones around him in heaven. It says in verse number 40 again, to sit on the right hand and the left hand is not to mind to give. Verse number 41, when the 10 heard it, they began much be displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them? And their great ones exercise authority upon them? But so shall it not be among you. It's not like that with me. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever will be of the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus is saying. You'll be blessed by my resignation. My resi resurrection what kind of host would we be to bring Jesus Christ to our home for a meal we do not want to be religious Pharisees with empty hearts filled with hypocrisy our challenge as we come to pray our invitation as we come to do business with the Lord is this as 21st century Christians, would we invite Jesus to our home for a meal with the proper attitude and the proper actions? Would it be a humbled time, a quieted time, a blessed time for us as we sit at the meal that Jesus has made for us. Would you please stand for a word of prayer? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the music has already started playing in the background and praising the Lord. Why don't you just join me in a word of prayer? God in heaven, thank you. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Thank you for scripture that is before us. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for being everything we need and showing us and teaching us and exemplifying what it means to have a meal with you at the table. One day it'll be that way, but for now, we're right here learning lessons from you. My prayer, holy God, my prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, is that you'll work in our hearts and as we come to pray, that we will do business with you and say, we don't want to be those Pharisees. We want to be humbled, quieted in your presence, and blessed 
by your resurrection. In Jesus' name, as the music plays.